In this episode, we talk about India's first winter expedition to the Arctic region and the significance of studying the area. We also give you an update on the suspensions of opposition MPs who have been protesting last week's parliamentary security breach. But first, we talk about the BJP's CM faces. Hi, I'm Rahil Filipos, and you are listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. Heading into this year's assembly elections, the BJP hadn't selected any chief ministerial candidates. Throughout its campaign, the party had mainly relied on the popularity of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. This gamble proved successful and the party secured power in Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh. However, over two weeks later, now that the party has chosen its three new chief ministers, it's hard to discern any clear pattern in its decision making. For instance, while Chhattisgarh CM Vishnu Deosai is an experienced leader, his Rajasthan counterpart Bhajanlal Sharma is a first-time MLA. So to understand the rationale behind the party's decisions and what it intends to signal, my colleague Shashank Bhargav speaks to the Indian Express's Vikas Pathak, who writes on politics for the paper. Vikas, when you take a look at the BJP's CM faces, what stands out to you the most about them? Well, what stands out most is the fact that uh, the BJP is entering the post-regional Shatrapira and uh, there's a stamp of the authority of the central leadership in the CM faces because uh, the BJP has chosen to do away with established regional leaders in the three states. So what we can say is that they are trying to groom a new leadership and uh, which also means that uh, the authority of the center or the high command on these states will be a lot more than earlier. And what do we understand about why the party has chosen to do this, especially considering the fact that the Lok Sabha polls are only a few months away? Well, I would say that if the party wanted to groom a new leadership and bring new faces, this was the ideal time to do it. Because these three states are states in which in the last two Lok Sabha polls, the party has done exceedingly well. So the likelihood of uh, doing very well in Madhya Pradesh, uh, Chhattisgarh and Rajasthan is very high in 2024. So this was the ideal time for a leadership change if they wanted to do it. And obviously they did want to do it. And so will it mean that the BJP will continue to rely on the central leadership to take calls and rely on PM Modi for campaigning? Yeah, in the campaign, in fact, uh, all through the campaign, it was pretty clear that the reliance was completely on the Prime Minister. One could say that Shivrat Singh Chauhan was very active of his own accord, in the sense that not that uh, he was expected to be, but perhaps he wanted to give it his best. But that apart, if you see the campaign in all the three states, for instance, the optics of every rally of the Prime Minister would be focusing on the Prime Minister and then talking about uh, the party as a collection of party workers with no hierarchy in between. The same was the case in Madhya Pradesh. That was the case in Chhattisgarh. These two states, at least I attended rallies of the Prime Minister. So it was pretty clear that the regional face does not count much. So obviously it was a projection of Narendra Modi in all the three states and uh, somehow it worked in all the three. So that has given a leeway to the party to be able to groom new leadership and that too with the choice of the central leadership. And talking about bringing in new leadership, the Rajasthan Chief Minister Bhajan Lal Sharma is a first-time MLA. Is that pick very unusual, would you say? Yeah, to an extent it is, because uh, no one expected Bhajan Lal Sharma to be chief minister. But let me put it this way, that they first decided on the face in Chhattisgarh. And uh, Chhattisgarh was the easiest to do from the point of view of the central leadership, because Mr. Raman Singh uh, was not uh, seeming to be very excited about the whole campaign too. So he was already in retirement mode to an extent, given his body language. And he was the first one whom they contacted and he just said, okay, whatever you say. Once that was done, then the pressure obviously was on Shiv Singh Chauhan because they had already replaced the longest serving chief minister of Chhattisgarh. So Mr. Chauhan also fell in line and uh, after that came Rajasthan. So Rajasthan, uh, it was expected that there could be some signs of resistance. But by that time, two states had already worked the way the central leadership wanted. And then Rajasthan also became easy because the pressure on Vasundhara Raja was immense. How do we explain uh, Bhajan Lal Sharma? Well, it is very difficult. But uh, let me tell you one thing. He belongs to Bharatpur and he was given a safe seat, Sanganer in Jaipur. So perhaps the party already had him in mind. And uh, the only logic that I came across, uh, you know, was uh, someone in the RSS who told me that uh, there was a perception doing the rounds in Uttar Pradesh and Bihar 
that uh, Brahmins are no longer becoming chief ministers. After Devendra Fadnavis, there was no Brahmin chief minister. And while they had Thakur chief ministers in Uttar Pradesh and also in uh, Himachal Pradesh, so the, the whole thing was that um, this perception, that is what someone told me, had to be kind of answered through a state like Rajasthan, where the main political contest is between, uh, one would say, in terms of social groups between Rajputs and Jats. Brahmins in Rajasthan are quite a neutral caste. So perhaps one could say that uh, that could be one of the things that the central leadership had in mind. But we are not sure. And when we talk about Chhattisgarh with the pick of Vishnu Diosai, uh, with him, the state is seeing its first tribal chief minister. And this has also come about partly because the BJP won a lot of seats in the prominent tribal belts, including uh, Sarguja. So talk about this pick and what the BJP is trying to signal through that. Well, if you see it uh, in connection with or linking it with the elevation of Draupadi Murmu as the president of India, it is very clear that the party is making a gesture or a pitch towards the tribes of central India and eastern India. So they are trying to breach the tribal vote bank, which they seem to have done to a great extent in Chhattisgarh this time. The two deputy CMs again, one is an OBC, Arun Sau from a significantly large community, the Sahus. The other is a very strong organizational man. Vijay Sharma has a background in the ABVP and Vijay Sharma is very well known in Kavardha, the place he comes from and where he defeated Mohammed Akbar. Let me tell you that Mohammed Akbar of the Congress had the largest margin in the last assembly elections, but he lost to Vijay Sharma with a significant margin. And the main campaign playing plank of Vijay Sharma during the elections was that he claimed that Mohammed Akbar was settling Rohingya Muslims in the area and that narrative really took off. So there's also a dash of Hindutva via Vijay Sharma, a dash of the ABVP organizational network, and also he's a Brahmin. So if you see the choice, it's tribal OBC Brahmin. Right, and now let's talk about Madhya Pradesh. The party did not pick Shivrat Singh Chauhan and instead went with Mohan Yadav, which is an unexpected choice. Could you talk about the rationale behind picking him? Yeah, if you look at the entire Hindi speaking belt, the BJP today is the party of the OBCs to a large extent and they have practically breached almost every OBC caste except the Yadavs in UP and Bihar, which are largely with the Lohiite parties, the Samajwadi and RBD. So fielding a Yadav or choosing a Yadav as the CM in Madhya Pradesh, where Yadavs are a very neutral caste, actually sends out a message to the Yadavs of UP and Bihar uh, for the Lok Sabha election. So if the BJP can breach even say 10% of Yadav votes more than uh, you know what it got last time, it might actually lead to a sweep. It is also a message to the Yadavs of North India that you need not rely on political families like the family of Mulayam Singh Yadav or you know Lalu Prasad the Yadav. Rather, there's always a chance that if you are just an activist of the BJP, you might be rewarded. And let me tell you that this choice could not have been made in UP and Bihar because in UP and Bihar, the Yadavs are a very influential caste and many caste groups have had a rivalry with them. So if you make a Yadav CM of UP or Bihar, in Bihar, maybe Bhumihars won't like it or even Kurmis may not like it for all you know. In UP, say Brahmins and Rajputs may not like it, Dalits may not like it. But in Madhya Pradesh, the Yadav has a very neutral image, but the messaging is such that it might impact UP and Bihar. So once again, the same pattern is there that uh, there's uh, a Brahmin deputy CM and at the same time, there's also a Dalit deputy CM. And Vikas, what do you think now lies ahead for people like Shivrat Singh Chauhan and Vasundra Raje, who are among the few strong regional leaders the party has, along with, of course, Raman Singh? Well, now it entirely depends on the central leadership, whether they want to give them something. It could be some place in the center, but that would again depend on what roadmap the central leadership has in mind for these people. So till now, we are not pretty sure about that. And you have been speaking to members within the BJP about this. What do they have to say about this kind of way forward? Well, members within the party say that the BJP has a different model these days compared to other political parties. So that's what someone in the BJP told me that in other political parties, they follow more of what is the model of the bureaucracy. In the bureaucracy, you will always be promoted till retirement. There is no notion of demotion, right? An IAS officer would go from director to joint secretary or whatever. It is not the other way around. But here the party wants to make it clear that it is an open game for any party worker. So if you are a small time party worker who's not prominent, 
covenant if you keep working the way the central leadership wants you to you may be rewarded unexpectedly and if even if you are a senior leader and you believe that uh, you already are a face if you do not do what the party leadership wants to do then you can be demoted to so now it is an open game so at one level it uh, keeps the senior leadership on its toes because they have to act according to the desire of the central leadership at the same time they say that it is also a ray of hope for uh, small time party workers because the reward may come unexpectedly unlike other parties like in the say congress or in samajwadi party etc you cannot expect this kind of a thing so that is the kind of logic that they are giving there's a horizontality through the rank and file of the party and next we talk about india's expedition to the arctic region India is all set to begin its year-round operations in its research station in the Arctic region. The research center, which is called Himadri, initially operated for only 180 days in a year, which included just the summer months. However, with the latest expedition, it has now become a part of the very few countries which are going to conduct research in the region all year round. On Monday, India sent off its first winter expedition to Himadri, comprising four scientists from four different institutions. To understand what were the challenges that restricted India from studying the Arctic region perennially, what all is in the pipeline with the new winter expedition, and what kind of impact does global warming have on the Arctic region, my colleague Niharika Nanda speaks to Anjali Marar, who is a science communication officer with Raman Research Institute in Bengaluru. So Anjali, can you first tell me why is it important to study and research the Arctic region more? So studying both the poles, the Arctic and the Antarctic, is very important because any changes happening at the poles can have direct and long-lasting impact on the weather and climate all over the world. This includes it can interfere with the monsoon, it can lead to extreme weather events. That is the main reason why we need to understand how. the arctic or the antarctic behaves right and considering the global warming and the temperature rise that the world is witnessing at the moment can you tell us what kind of an impact has that had on the arctic region so arctic is the most or one of the most vulnerable regions on earth which is facing the brunt of global warming already there have been several several reports which have uh, given startling numbers in terms of temperatures and uh, the extent of sea ice that is getting melting away with each passing year to give you a better understanding the arctic has warmed over 4 degrees celsius on an average in the past one century the sea ice extent which is like if you imagine of arctic we all can imagine it can be large swathes of um, ice sheets and ice covered area which do not melt but sadly that's not the case the amount of sea ice which has declined or at the rate at which the sea ice is declining is about 13% per decade and uh, if this rate of sea ice decline continues and the temperatures keep rising as we are all experiencing there could be a day not very far away from today when the entire arctic could go ice free and uh, one can only imagine all the ice melting and the water sea level rise which can impact all over the world so arctic is definitely one of the areas which is facing the global warming's effect by each passing day and with such a massive increase in the temperatures of the arctic region as well and with the impact of global warming continuing is there a chance that we will get to see human habitation happening in the arctic region in the long run could you tell us a little about that aspect so in uh, some of the arctic regions there is human habitation even now though there is limited human habitation but uh, if global warming continues and if we come to a, arrive at a day wherein it is completely ice free the temperatures are warm enough where humans and animals can thrive where bacteria all these can thrive and which are not presently over there so from a hostile condition it will become a more habitable condition so it will entirely alter what arctic is otherwise known as which means that there'll be more people uh, likely to go there there will be uh, countries wanting to explore the mineral resources and other marine and uh, non living resources so it could be a place of great interest if by chance the global warming continuing and arctic turning to be ice free right and we are talking about this today because india's arctic research center which is called himadri it will now be operational throughout the year including the winter months as well could you tell us what were the challenges that restricted the year round operations earlier 
So, uh, as we understand, the Arctic uh, region is owned by about eight countries, and they are bound by an Arctic Council. The countries are Canada, Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Norway, Russia, Sweden, and the United States. So, uh, there are certain countries which have a control on the Arctic region, which is why there is very little space available for performing or carrying out independent research. The geographical location of the Arctic region is such that there are very few days in a year when there is daylight. The temperatures are extremely low, as in the coldest month, the mean temperature in the Arctic can go all about till minus 15 degrees Celsius. It's an absolute hostile environment out there, which is why most of the researchers around the world, so there are about 10 countries who are presently have some presence in the Arctic, they have restricted the research work to summer months. But uh, India, in 2008, decided to set up its own research base. It is known as Himadri. And uh, until 2022, even India was able to manage only summer expeditions because of all these challenging reasons, which is why it could not have a year-long presence, which is going to change here onwards. And Anjali, going back a little, could you tell us what all had India done in the region while it was operating just for 180 days a year, mostly during the summer months? So primarily, India's effort and endeavor in the Arctic research has been to understand the climate change and understand, uh, perform climate studies. Besides, there were also a few studies which were uh, taken up to understand the geology, the glaciology, and to some amount of uh, marine and biological life sciences. So whatever little we know about the Arctic has been through the research papers and the findings which India, along with their collaborators, were able to understand primarily in the area of uh, atmospheric sciences, which is now going to expand. Of course, there'll be more uh, areas getting added as we have year-long presence in the Arctic region. Some of the areas could be astronomy, astrophysics. We could uh, try and understand how other atmospheric factors, as I was mentioning earlier, they relate to the world climate. Right. So finally, now that Anjali, India is amongst one of those very few group of nations which have their operations running perennially in the Arctic. Can you tell us what all is in the pipeline and what kind of plans are there for studying and for doing research in the Arctic region? Right. So there are few countries, as you rightly said, who have presence uh, in the Arctic region, some of them being Norway, France, the United Kingdom, Italy. So India is uh, through this winter expedition and its plans to have a year-long presence is uh, not only joining this elite group of countries who have its presence, but uh, is also signing up for an important uh, contribution in filling these data and knowledge gaps which are present from the Arctic region. So due to limited amount of observatories or observations coming from that region or not many people who are working, who are able to access the location, there are always dark areas. We do not know what is happening in the Arctic and how are we impacted. So now that India is joining this uh, small group of countries, in the coming years, as we make observations and gather information and interpret the data, possibly we are contributing to the pool of knowledge in under better understanding the Arctic and its role on climate, biological and um, other sciences. So the first batch of uh, the winter expedition to the Arctic has just begun and there are uh, four institutions participating in this first batch. They will be spending time over the next one month at the Himadri research base. And uh, the studies vary from rainfall to um, understanding the radio quietness in the Arctic, all the way to lightning and also aerosols. So these are the four broad areas that the first batch of uh, researchers who are going to be at Himadri and carry out their studies. And finally, we give you an update on the parliament. Yesterday, 49 more Lok Sabha MPs were suspended for disrupting House proceedings. The list of MPs included Congress leader Shashi Tharoor, Manish Tiwari, Karti Chidambaram and NCP leader Supriya Sule. With this, a total of 141 MPs have now been suspended in this winter session of the Parliament, 95 from Lok Sabha and 46 from the Rajya Sabha. The opposition MPs have been protesting last week's parliamentary security breach and demanding a discussion and a statement from Union Home Minister Amit Shah on the matter. Scenes of chaos played out in both houses of parliament yesterday as opposition leaders continued their protests showing placards and shouting slogans which ultimately resulted in 49 more suspensions. 
मेरा आग्रह आपसे कि आप चर्चा करें संवाद करें ये तख्तियां लेकर सदन में मर्यादित आचरण नहीं है मान्य सदस्यगण Following Tuesday's suspensions, opposition leaders like Congress's Shashi Tharoor accused the centre of writing the obituary of parliamentary democracy in India. The basic principle of parliamentary accountability has been violated by the Home Minister not coming to the House to a talk about what he has been telling the media outside, and secondly to initiate a discussion, which would have been the right thing to do. Neither of which has happened. Then, when opposition protested that, demanding it, they were suspended. So today, in solidarity with my colleagues, I too joined the protest, and everybody, literally, uh, uh, who was present today, has been uh, suspended for the rest of the session. Which means that they want to pass their bills without any discussion. I think it's a betrayal of parliamentary democracy. It's a betrayal of what Parliament is all about. It's a betrayal of the basic standards, principles, and conventions by which this house should be functioning. You know. Meanwhile, Congress leader Adhir Ranjan Chaudhary alleged that the scenes playing out in Parliament were nothing short of anarchy. In a single word, I can say that it is nothing but an anarchy being played inside the Parliament. Anarchy being played inside the Parliament. They don't have even an iota of faith. upon the parliamentary system in our country so that is why it is nothing but an anarchy 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 during a bjp parliamentary meet yesterday morning prime minister narendra modi criticized the protesting opposition leaders saying that antics will ensure that the opposition's numbers will go down in the 2024 lok sabha polls stating that some are not destined to do constructive work the prime minister said the opposition would not return to lok sabha even in the current strength He has learned to have told BJP MPs that they should not get shaken by the theatrics of the opposition. Parliamentary Affairs Minister Prala Joshi told news agency PTI that the Prime Minister also expressed concern at attempts to justify Parliament security breach, saying it is as worrisome as the incident itself. His remarks seem to be with reference to Congress leader Rahul Gandhi blaming unemployment and price rise for the parliament breach that saw two people who were carrying smoke canisters jumping from the visitors gallery into the chamber of the Lok Sabha. Both of them were heard chanting slogans such as Tana Shahi Nahi Chalegi which loosely translates to dictatorship won't be accepted. They were ultimately overpowered by the Lok Sabha members and the ward staff. Around the same time two other people also released colored smoke from canisters while shouting slogans outside the parliament premises. The families of the suspects say they were despondent over not getting a job. A total of 6 people have been arrested in connection with the incident so far. You were listening to 3 things by the Indian Express. Today's show was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. It was written and produced by me, Rahil Philippos, Niharika Nanda, Shashank Bhargav, and Ucha Sarman. If you like the show, then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at Express Podcast and write to us at podcast at the rate IndianExpress dot com.